the dingo has been heavily prosecuted in Australia. To the extent that sanctuaries are needed across Australia to protect part of the population from lethal control measures. Here in Queensland, Australia, it is illegal to have a dingo as a pet. If you are a zoo or a sanctuary, the government, after many inspections, may give you permission to have a dingo. Because the dingo is classified as a feral pet, same as our cane toad, and um, so that's it, got to be killed and shot on site. But under Queensland law, conservation law, they're protected species. Under the um, Landholders Act, they're a feral pest and they can be shot. What really started the prosecution and demonisation of these species was when colonies arrived. A point of view that is prominent even in modern times. A saying that's been going on and passed down from generation to generation is farmers are saying to their sons, a good dingo is a dead dingo. So when you've got children growing up with this mentality from their parents, that is what they believe. And, and where all this comes from, as soon as Captain Cook and General MacArthur that came to Australia, um, they just didn't like the dingo, called him a devil dog. Everyone hated dingoes, they hated snakes, they hated anything to do with, with conservation. So farmers thought they had the right, they could do whatever they want with the land and just kill off all, all the dingoes to their detriment. So in Australia, uh, basically you have 99% of the farmers. Uh, doesn't matter whether they're growing crops or even livestock, they hate dingoes. And that is a view that is exacerbated by a low awareness and the media coverage. Our media will promote or project the dingo as a, an evil, baby-eating, feral monster. The media also puts a lot of emphasis on the rare dingo attack. Then the domestic dog attacks that are more common and numerous. Now we've got a great With the villainisation of the dingo in media, it has made the threats to the species' survival to be human interaction with. White farmers, um, ignorant people, uh, ignorant politicians, um, yeah, the threat and the, how they uh, use that threat is by uh, dumping 1080 poison. It's the most evil poison in the world. Uh, originally it was made in America. Uh, I think it's stopped now, but it's now been made in Australia. It's banned all throughout the world, except um, New Zealand and Australia. Um, even Hitler, even as bad and evil as he was, he refused to use the poison because he knew how bad it was. So that sort of says something. Tan-80 poison in sodium fluoracetate. The effects it has on canines are like some of the symptoms of rabies. The effect on the central nervous system is indicated by the sudden appearance of hyperexcitability and abrupt bouts of running and barking. Deaf is the result of the effects repeated and the prolonged convulsions on the respiratory centre. The Australian government puts poison into a chunk of meat and then baits the dingo into eating it. Bait is now dropped four times a year in, in Australia, every three months. And they do it uh, right on the breeding season of dingoes. They do it on purpose. They try and bait the dingoes before they mate up. Then after the pups are born, they're baiting again. Now they're using helicopters and aeroplanes. It's just, we've got no hope for the world. Not only dingoes and dogs out there, but um, other meat-eating animals that are picking it up. Though, even with the negative views and management of the dingo, there are people that are doing their best to save as many as they can to their own detriment. I have had people come here, steal dingoes, they're poisoned one, um, the death threats, all that sort of thing. 
it's not nice. You just really want to make these people go away permanently. These people who are working to save the dingo are focusing on having the people care about this species through educating. And it just takes time, like anything else, to gently, slowly make changes through all that education. So places like my sanctuary, which is um, unique to all other zoos and sanctuary in Queensland because um, their enclosures for the dingoes are very well architecturally designed and landscaped so it all looks nice and pretty because they have to make money out of their dingoes. So um, here, because my dingoes live in a natural wild environment, we're living out in the bush, they've got reasonably large enclosures, um, the ground is virtually unkept uh, except by whippersnip around the electric fences, but it basically it's leaving as wild as possible. So the dingoes are like digging, building tunnels and climbing up trees and ripping logs apart and all that sort of thing. So if you've got a beautifully manicured enclosure for the public, I can see why they have to do it, but um, my interest in dingoes is all about understanding the wild dingo. All of mine here are wild. So I, I feel privileged that uh, what I've got I can share with people. Uh, by doing that is either through you know, videos like this, docos, or uh, the different stuff that I put up on YouTube to just educate the general public as to you know, how dingoes are. And actually the dingo is very timid and shy, um, doesn't really like hanging around people and, and that sort of thing. And in Aboriginal culture, they were believed to see into the supernatural, warning the people about evil spirits and protecting their territory from them. However, they were also seen as tricksters. What are dingoes like? You know, they're just like dogs. And he goes, just imagine a cheeky monkey in a dog suit. And so if you sort of have that in your mind, you can sort of say, yeah, they're always up to mischief, always playing games, you can't train them. Everything they do is on their terms. Even with all the negativity, there has been change in the opinions on dingoes over the years. It's slowly changing, only because we now have some scientists who are doing more research and positive research, um, saying that by killing off the dingo on properties is uh, to the detriment of the farmer. Uh, because dingoes being a top order predator, they will keep the numbers of the roos down. Um, so if there's less roos on the property, it means there's more grass for the farmer, for his sheep, for his kangaroos, and you'll find a decent farmer who will turn around and admit this old saying that good dingoes are dead dingo is just so wrong that by allowing dingoes on your property because dingoes manage themselves so you always have a stable group of dingoes there they control their territory so they don't have other dingoes to come in and by that way if there's any They'll control the numbers, of, say the kangaroos, the pigs, foxes, rabbits, all those other animals that are fighting or eating the farmer's grass for his livestock. So the dingoes will do that 24-7. So we have some farmers now understanding that, realising that, OK, if we've got dingoes there and they're getting rid of these other feral pests, well then it's beneficial to my property and, and to my land. However, even with the slowly changing attitudes and research, lethal control measures are still the most used management action. Until the farmers and the government open their eyes to education, not only from people like me, but from other farmers that uh, do understand the benefits of having dingoes, uh, nothing's going to change.